If you'll go ahead and turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We are going to go through John chapter 21. Uh, this week, this will be the ending of the book. And then next week, we'll kind of do a recap of the entire book. And that will be a sprint all the way through it. But we're familiar with it, so we should be able to move. In John chapter 20, so what, are, what is John chapter 20 about? And just a review from last week. Just about the resurrection and Christ's appearance in different settings. Yeah, yeah, his resurrection and the uh, the eyewitness accounts that start to happen after that resurrection. Um, we we talk specifically whenever John is writing this that he's writing uh, more specifically about Mary Magdalene rather than the other women that we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, again, this is just an eyewitness account that John has given us. And you can kind of see, and we talked about some of the very fine details that he talks about, like I got there first, I just looked in, I didn't go in, Peter actually went in, and then I came in. So that, that type of stuff really kind of tells us that this actually did happen, uh, and that's how it happened. Um, and then um, we see uh, Mary Magdalene, and she uh, runs into Jesus whenever she comes to the, to the tomb. Uh, she looks inside, and she sees not linens the way that the others did but two angels and then she hears this voice or, or I don't know what causes her to turn around but she turns around and you know he said well you know what's going on here and she thought it was the gardener and she says hey look if you've moved the body of my Lord please let me know and um, didn't recognize it was him and then she recognized it was him um, and then in verse 16 Jesus said to her Mary and that's when she realized who it was and we talked a little bit about that I, I do think that that was very purposefully uh, placed in there um, and then he tells her hey stop clinging to me I've not gone to the father yet in other words I'm still going to be around um, so there's no reason to uh, cling to me at you know, you've got a mission to do and her mission was to go and tell as he says my brethren and this is the first time we've kind of noted that he says this um, about the apostles is notes them as his brethren, and um, he also says, um, um, you know, go go tell her that. So evening of that day, she goes and she tells tells them in verse 19. So it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, the disciples were there, and there was a reason that they had those doors locked. And what was it? Now in verse 19, 20, verse 19. Yeah, because of the Jews, they were, they, you know, still they were after the disciples of Christ, um, obviously. And if you'll remember, um, they tried to, they were wanting to kill Jesus, and they were wanting to kill someone else also. And who was that? Lazarus, because he was evidence. Um, and we, we got to do away with the evidence. Well, now you have people um, who have been following him. Well, you can't have his teaching going, you know, being spread around. So. Um, the door's locked, and he just kind of shows up in, in all of them, but there was somebody missing. Who was that? One of the, yeah, Thomas was missing. And um, so Thomas finally shows up, and, it's up, and the disciples are very excited, and they said, hey, you won't believe this. He's been here. And then Thomas says, unless I can touch the holes and put my finger in his side, I will not believe. And so it is not that he just doubts. Well, I kind of doubt that. You know, it is that I will not believe unless I have the evidence in front of me. Now, again, I think we pointed out that these are very reasonable people. Now, these other disciples didn't have a, a, an issue with any kind of doubt because well, Jesus was there. They saw the evidence. Thomas still has not seen that, and that's what he's asking for. And then after eight days, and that is again on the first day of the week, Verse 26, disciples were again inside. So it seems as if this is kind of when they're coming together, uh, at least on the first day of the week. They were in, inside, and Thomas is there, and Jesus came, the doors having been shut, locked again, and he stood in their midst, and he says, Peace be with you. And that was the exact thing that he had said to the disciples uh, earlier, so Thomas knows that who this is. And then uh, he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger, my, see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put your 
put it in my side and do not be unbelieving but believing so he doesn't even say doubting don't be unbelieving be believing and is that enough for Thomas does he actually have to do what he said he was going to do no just him being there and then uh, Thomas makes the statement um, my Lord and my God and then Jesus said to him because you've seen that's why you believe blessed is he blessed are they who do not see and yet believe and then in verse 30 we see that the reason that the book was um, that the book was written was because of that statement that Jesus made in other words verse 30 therefore many other signs and wonders Jesus did but I wrote these down so that you would be able to know um, but these have been written down in verse 31 so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. And we talked about this a little bit about we read it and we believe it. Now there were people there uh, and that we've read all the way through John and we're going to really kind of take some time to look at some of, some of that next week that saw all of these signs that John just wrote down for us. And we find out later in uh, John 21 there were a lot more signs also. Um, but even here, he's like, you know, there's a lot of signs that he's performed that I just didn't write down. This is not an exhaustive list of everything that he did. But I wrote these down so that you would believe. People saw them, and they chose not to believe. So, um, you know, as blessed as we are, it's also we have to be able to take the Word of God, present it to our family and friends and to others, and say, this is the evidence. This is the eyewitness accounts of these things happening. All right, any questions or comments before we move into John chapter 21? All right, let's move on. John chapter 21, uh, let's read uh, verses 1 through one through 3. Um, and who wants to read that for us? Paul, will you read that, please? After these things, Jesus showed Himself again to the disciples at the sea of... Uh, and then this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, <coughs> Simon Peter Thomas called the twin the tangle of Hand <coughs> in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other <coughs> of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to him, I am going fishing. They said to him, We are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into a boat. And that night, they caught nothing. Alright, so a rough night of fishing these guys are having. But what we see is a couple of things. First of all, where is this happening? Galilee. It's in Galilee, specifically by the Sea of Tiberias. And if you will, turn to John chapter 6 because I believe that Jesus chose this spot for a very specific reason. And in John chapter 6, something else happens uh, there in John chapter 6 at that, um, you know, that, that place. John chapter 6 and verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And then there's this big, large crowd that is there. And what happens? What miracle is this? He feeds the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000. What did he feed them? The fish and the bread. The fish and the loaves. The fish and the bread. And keep that in mind as we move through John chapter 21. Um, so we see these guys. Uh, they decide they're going to go fishing. Uh, or actually Simon Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. And then the other two, uh, Thomas called the twin, and then Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples decide they're going to go with him also. Um, we're going to go with you. And so they go down to the boat, they go out, they go fishing for the night, and nothing. Now, does this kind of sound familiar? Either A, something kind of going on here, or these guys are not very good fishermen because this is not the first time that we've read about them coming back without any fish. So, plot thickens. In verse 4, 
And this, you know, I think uh, as we read this, also you'll see this kind of the same thing with uh, Mary Magdalene. Uh, Jesus was not recognizable. In verse uh, 4, it says, Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. So either, hey, he was too far away for them to notice, or, you know, there's something there that, you know, they, they can't recognize him. Um, and Jesus says to them something, and that is, he asks a question, what is it? Do you have fish? And, uh, you know, after a rough night of uh, fishing, it's probably the last thing, eh, nothing biting, you know, it wasn't hitting the bait or whatever. And uh, they answered him, no. And he said, well then, do what? Catch the net on the other side. Right. Now, this story that I'm going to refer back to is not mentioned in John. But this is not the first time that he's told them this. Actually, in Luke chapter 5, uh, if you'll back up to Luke chapter 5 is where it's mentioned also. Um, and we'll start in verse, well, we can start in verse uh, 3. Getting to one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out to the deep and let down your nets for a catch. For, for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we told all night and took nothing. Sounds familiar, right? But at your word, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled the partners in the other boat, we need some help over here, we've got too many fish. And so, in verse uh, 8, but when Simon Peter saw it, when he saw this, what did he do? And said, Depart from me, I am a sinful man. And so we see that he's already recognizing the power that Jesus has very early. Now again, this was not mentioned in John, but it's mentioned in John chapter 21 as kind of a recap of things. And that and I wanted to kind of read that because of what um, one of the disciples say um, in this. And he said cast to the, and I'm back in John chapter 21, he says then cast on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And then verse 7 says what? Give me a second to read it. Therefore, that disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Right, and so that prompted John to say, it's the Lord. Because we've played this over before, we, we see that this is something that has happened before. And so whenever he sees this, what does Peter do? He acts like Peter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he acts like Peter. Now, the question is, why did he jump in? And I think that's a, probably a pretty good response because it's Peter. And he, he jumps in the ocean uh, and then uh, swims out to him. And the dis other disciples, they have a little bit more reason about him, I guess. In verse 8, the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, and they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. And so they weren't too far out, and so they um, get, the, get the land out, or get the uh, boat back to, back to the land. Um, some, of the, some of the questions that I had is, um, what did the Jesus tell the men to do with their nets? Cast them to the right side. Now, is there significance in that? I don't know if there's a significance as to why he said the right side. I just know he told them the right side. And something like that, normally, uh, again, when you're talking about an eyewitness account, he's going to remember that it was the right side, not the left. So again, just more of these small little tiny details that we can see that this is actually an eyewitness account. It's not something that's just being made up. Because normally we'd say, you know, just cast them out. 
And if you look at the the um, the one that we uh, spoke of in um, Luke chapter five, it says, um, and Simon said, "We told all night and took nothing." And you know, so this was not an eyewitness account that Luke was writing. It was just he was uh, accounting for what other people had told him, and it didn't say which side. So I believe that John's is telling us I was there and it was on the right side. Now, whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. It just seems to me that it's a little bit more believable when you have those small little details like that. Um, but we do see that there was a large catch and there's going to be actually, we're going to talk about this catch because we're not even done talking about it yet. And so Peter jumps in, he swims out, the others bring the, bring the nets in, um, and we see they were about 100 yards off. Um, in verse 9, we see when they got out and land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. So again, we're at the place that the 5,000 were fed. They were fed fishes and loaves. And yet here we are and what's being prepared? Fishes and loaves. And then we got this little charcoal fire. Now, do I think that has anything to do? Well, I think it does because I kind of look at a few things also uh, and look at things that, you know, maybe if it were important specifically with the conversation that is about to happen. If you will, turn to John chapter um, 18 and verse 18. John chapter 18 and verse 18. Stephen, do you mind reading that? Now a certain ox was to have made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with him and warmed himself. Alright, so here we have this charcoal fire in uh, John chapter 18 with Peter there, and who's he with? The what? The enemies of Christ. And what happens? We don't kind of know that story. What happens? Yeah, aren't you the guy? No, that's not me. But I think I know that's not me. And then the last time we start swearing at people, I am not that guy that you think that I am. But notice he's warming himself by the fire of these people. Um, and he makes this statement three times that it is not me, it's not me, it's not me. And um, do I think this significant here? I don't really know, but I just, to me, it's odd. And then we get to John chapter 21, and we see they get out on the land. There's a small charcoal fire. There's fishes. There's loaves there. So there's a lot of imagery kind of going on here. And then Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter, he is dried off now, I guess, and he's going back to the boat. Now, notice what John says about this catch. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish. As a matter of fact, there's 153 of them. Now, why is that in there? Well, it's significant about the fact that those 153 fish didn't break the net. So that was a large number. Yeah. He's very specific about that number. Somebody counted those fish. <laughs> And so that tells me again that this isn't something that was just made up. It was, it's a very specific detail specifically about that catch that was on the right side. And um, we see you know, these small little details again show an eyewitness account, not just something that they heard or something that they made up. And um, he's very specific about that. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Now, how Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, I don't know how that worked out. Um, you know, but we do know that it was a large catch, and it was so, so much so that they had trouble kind of getting it in. Go ahead, Andrew. When they rode the boat to shore, they dragged the net with Okay, so it's up there already, I guess. But um, what we see is that um, he hauls the net ashore, Again, a very specific detail. Jesus says to them, come and have breakfast. And so they're going to have breakfast with him. And this, again, is the account that um, John is giving. Um, 
Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? And there's a reason they didn't ask him that. Why? They knew who he was. They knew who he was. They knew who he was. Go ahead. And that's put in there sort of like before when he talked to them from shore, they didn't know who it was. Now, if if you were standing a hundred yards from me and calling me, I might be able to recognize your voice. These accounts with his appearances, they're very often unsure of who it is, not even recognizing his voice at first. And it, it seems to indicate that the resurrection body was different than right. the body before, although it was a bodily resurrection. There's, and we don't know, you know, Paul talked about how in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, the seed goes in the ground, the stock comes up. Right. And as the Lord did that, we're going to do that. We're going to be like Him. We will appear as He is. And so the, there's a mystery for us, at least, well, for me at least, mm -hmm. surrounding His resurrection body, these appearances, why they don't recognize Him at first, but these actions and then His words clearly indicate to them this is the Lord. Right. Yeah, and you know, well, we know just by what he told them to do and by what the result of that was, of that obedience was, John knew who it was. And and then it clicked for Peter also. And so, you know, by that time, we know what's going on. And um, again, you know, I don't really know why they're not able to, you know, because there's other accounts also in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where he's just kind of walking along and they're having like this whole long conversation about the resurrection and all that kind of, or about the crucifixion. And he's having this conversation with them and they don't even recognize who he is. And so, you know, there, there may be something to that. Um, but we do know that with him, you know, talking to Thomas, that the, the, the scarred hands, the, all of that is still there. So... Um, but no one asked him who you are because they knew it was the Lord. They knew by all of this, specifically maybe where they are and all of this imagery that's happening. And um, so he says, come out, have, uh, have some breakfast. Um, Jesus came and took the bread, gave it to them, so with, and he did so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they've seen him three times now. Uh, just with these close this close net of people all right any questions or comments because we're going to move into why i don't think that the charcoal fire in john 18 and what's happening here also i think they're kind of connected go ahead we were just talking about his his body we also know that there were disciples that saw him go to the crucifixion and we know in Isaiah it talked about how it fulfilled the prophecy that when they looked upon him he looked like a slaughtered lamb because of how he had been beaten so I can kind of understand another part of them not really recognizing him right away it's also because the last time that some of them that saw him he was so bad Mangled. and bruised um, could be, I, you know, I don't know. It's just not very specific about why. I just know that they were 100 yards off. That's probably why they didn't. They probably why they didn't recognize him then. Um, but um, but we also see that Mary Magdalene had a little trouble also. Exactly. So you know, I, right. we don't really even from the very even from the tomb. It was he was so different, and wasn't there a shining countenance to him? Uh, I don't know if there's one in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. But, but I, that's how I picture it. He's kind of got this little bit, but I don't know. It doesn't say that, though. Um, all right. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus and Simon Peter have this conversation. Now remember, poor old Simon Peter promised the Lord, if you, wherever you go. I'm going. And Jesus told him, where I go, you cannot go as of right now. If you go to die, I go to die. And then what did Jesus tell Simon he was going to do? You're going to 
deny me three times for the cock crows. And then we're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what happens? They come to pick up Jesus. Peter's not going to deny him. So what does he do? Well, he took out the sword, remember? Cut the guy's ear off. And then they disperse. And then we see him warming himself by that fire with the, um, with the others. And that's when the denial starts to happen. And now the question comes in, Son, Son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, I don't know what the these is. You know, I've read different things. If he's talking about the disciples there, if he's talking about the fish, if he's talking about the loaves, I don't know. Whatever it was, it's very pointed. Do you love me more than these? And his answer is what? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Now, in the English, it doesn't quite translate because the question is, do you agape me? And the answer is, uh, anybody know? Yeah, phileo. I phileo you, which is a lower type of love. It's not a, a sacrificial love the way that agape is. And so he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Now, is this significant? Because remember, he's already said, I don't know who the man is. I've never been around the man. And then he starts cussing there at the very end and says, "I, no, I, I'm not the person you think that I am. I, I don't know who this guy is. And so now he asks, do you love me? And his answer is, you know that I love you, Lord. Um, and he says to him, feed my lambs. Do you think that he's saying this? Do you think that he's given him a mission now? Yes. Yes, he most certainly is. And this isn't the only time that he gives him this mission. I we're about to read a little bit more. Um, but um, we also see, if you will, turn to John chapter 10. And um, if you remember, um, this is the, where Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and he flees. So what he's saying is that the good shepherd is leaving, so he's got to leave somebody in charge of those of the caring of those lambs. And so that's what's happening here. The male is kind of being given not specifically just to Peter, but to their mission that they have. But P Peter specifically, because you can see the passion that Peter has. What? Well, in, the, in the, the difference of the two terms of love here, Peter's constantly assuring him, I love you dearly like a brother. I love you. Personally, I love you. And Peter, and, and Christ is, is using the term that he would use like you're saying, there's work to do as a servant. Right. Serve. And you love to serve. Right. You know? Yeah, it's a sacrificial love. You've got to lay down the life that you currently have and go to something else. And we're going to see that explanation come in a little later uh, in this conversation as well. And then Peter has questions about that. But he asked him, he asked him this. We do know that this, the, you know, Christ has done his mission that God gave him. And he is giving now Peter, his mission that he has to do while he's here on earth. And then so he says, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, now I don't know if there's more conversation in between here. I just know that John is recording this for us. And he says to Peter again, and this time he actually uses that word phileo, and he says uh, to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. So feed my sheep, tend my sheep. In other words, guide them, make sure that everything's taken care of uh, with my sheep. Um, now, I thought it was interesting because um, when we look at this conversation, and specifically in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, um, Peter uh, is talking uh, specifically to elders, and what does he say to the elders in 1 Peter chapter 5? What's their job? Shepherd the flock. 
of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. So you see that now Peter is starting to exit out by the time we get to 1 Peter 5. And he's now giving the uh, charge over to another group of men. And so we see this perpetuation of watching over God's flock. Any questions or comments? All right. And he says, you know, feed my sheep. Um, and then he says to him a third time. Now again, I don't know if there's other conversation in there. I just know this is the third time that he asks him. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter started to be grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? So why do you think that upsets Peter? Well, they're real close. And uh, I guess he's feeling a little insulted there because I was you know, already told him that I care about you. And now here you're asking for the same thing. Yeah. You keep, you keep repeating the same question. Maybe Peter's thinking that Jesus has some doubt about that because of the denials that's been happening. And this is Peter's time that he can kind of come up and say, yes, you know that I do. And we also see that Peter's faith continues to go up and down, rise and wane, you know, but we see that here, um, what we see with Peter is he asked him three times if he loved him. In what ways do you think this is kind of starting to reestablish Peter where he needs to be? I'm sorry, but go ahead, Chuck. Many times did he deny it? Three times. And so now he gets to say, I love you three times. And we're going to see more of the conversation that happens that Jesus is going to talk to him about, um, about what's about to happen to him in the future. Well, when the, uh, he was taken and crucified, of course he did deny it, but then he denied it three times, just like Jesus said. And up until this point, he hadn't had a chance to repent. Um, this was really hard. Yeah, I believe so too. And what we see also, now imagine this, that in the future, had this not happened, and then Peter had to, to talk to people about Christ, and they would say, aren't you the guy that denied Him three times? And now we have the offsetting. Um, I, well, I saw Him after the resurrection. I told Him I loved Him three times. He asked me, and I told Him, and He told me I need to take care of His sheep. You know, so all of this is starting to happen now for Peter's benefit. Maybe painful for Peter, but it is for his benefit. Alright, and then finally he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And then he adds this, Truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. So what is he saying here? That the life that you currently live you have to mature to a certain point and someone else has to kind of lead you. And that's exactly what's starting to happen here. He's putting him on a different mission. Go ahead. The, the whole thing is unfolding to let Peter know that the Lord knows Peter does love him. Right. It never was a question of him loving the Lord. It was a question of the fear was greater than the love at that particular point. And here as John follows up in 19, he's, the Lord just told him, you, you've got work to do. He's already told him, you've got work to do. Tending the sheep, feeding the sheep. But you're going to sacrifice your life for me. Yeah. And, and, and as you said, you know, in the very next verse, that's exactly what he said. Because he said this to tell Peter exactly what type of death he was going to glorify God after saying that he said this to him. Um, if you will turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14. 
And Peter admits this conversation that happened by this charcoal fire with Jesus. And if you will, back up to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So he's run his race and he knows that he's going to have to put off this body soon. And so he is trying his best to make sure um, to stir up by way of reminder all of these things to the audience that he's writing to. And so he actually mentions that. And in verse 15, And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able to take may be able at any time to recall these things. In other words, that's why I'm writing these things down and reminding you of these things because my time is at hand just as Jesus said it would be. And the conversation doesn't stop here because Jesus, or, um, Peter says, i got some questions about that. Uh, turning back to John chapter 21 in verse 19, this he said about when you're old, someone else is going to lead you. He said this to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So when you're old, someone's going to take your hands and they're going to show you where to go. Who should he be following? Only Christ. Only Christ. And so Christ is taking him by the hands and telling him where he ought to go. So the imagery is kind of thick here in, in this. Alright, let's move on down. Let me actually finish. Uh, verse 20. Peter turned, after all this is saying, he turns and sees the disciple whom Jesus loves following. So evidently they're walking along whenever this conversation is going on. And he turns around and he sees John. <coughs> and what does he ask? What about him? About this guy. Now, I don't know why he asked that. You know, maybe he's just curious. You know, you just told me about, you know, the life I'm supposed to live. What about this guy back here? And um, when Peter, in verse 21, when Peter saw him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus says to him something that's very interesting, and I think it's something that we all can learn from. And what does he say? Don't, if, I, if I want to live until the end of time, what difference does that make to you? Yeah, how's that any of your concern at all? What's going to happen with him? You know, we're talking about you right now. We're focusing on you. And we're focusing on your mission, and we're focusing on what you have to do. And he said, so, you know, what he does until I, if he remains until I come again, what is, what is that for you? Now, there's some misconception, obviously, that starts to happen. And it also mentions um, to him in verse uh, 23, so the saying started to spread among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. However, Jesus did not say that. And he says that exactly. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? That's important to note. Because that exists also even in today's religious world. That somewhere out there, John still lives. But he did not say that, that he would not uh, die, but just that, what's it to you if he, if he does? And, but uh, backing up, he says, um, what's it to you that I've come? What, what is it to you? You follow me. I've already given you the instruction. When you're old, people are going to pull you by. You need to follow me. And that's exactly what he says. And then this spreading, and it says around the brothers. Anybody know why it says that? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 15, was it just the 11 that were meeting um, in Acts chapter 1? I'm in verse 15. Acts chapter 1 and verse 15, it talks about some of the other people who were there in Jerusalem. Yeah, there's 120. And it even says, in those days Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons who were all at about 120, and that's whenever they decided um, we need to... Um, replace Judas. 
but there was 120 of them there. So that may be what he's talking about there whenever he said, so that kind of starts spreading around the brothers. Yeah. All right. Back on back up into uh, John chapter 21. Um, and we'll start in verse 24. This is the disciple, and that is the one that Jesus was just talking about. It, what's that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. How do we know his testimony is true? There are other eyewitnesses, but he's saying this, I, I was there. I was there. I'm bearing witness of this. Um, and we see in John chapter 15, I have to turn there, but John chapter 15 and verse 27, it says, and you also, and Jesus is talking to, to the disciples at this uh, moment in time. Remember, this is during that um, Passover feast. And he says in John chapter 15, verse 27, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And so he says that to his disciples. And so with those men who were there, they are the ones who will be bearing witness. And that's how we know that what he's saying is true because he was there from the beginning. And remember also when you turn to Acts chapter 1 and they're trying to replace Judas, what was one of the qualifications? Yeah, from the, yeah, he had to be there from the beginning before he could even be put into there really to cast the lot out. All right, and then it goes on to say, uh, who's bearing witness about these things and who's written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. This is not the, uh, and if you look at this statement, who has written these things, and then uh, turn to 1 John chapter 3, and I, you know, I thought this was uh, interesting, uh, the way that this, that he continues to use the word we know. And in John chapter, I'll read John chapter 21, when we go to John chapter 3, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, and the disciple who was bearing witness about these things, who has written these things, um, we know that his testimony is true. And if you'll turn to John chapter 3, or 1 John chapter 3, in verse 14, it says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not um, love abides in death. He also uses this term in 1 John chapter 5. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of Him. He also mentions in John chapter, 1 John chapter 5 verses 18 through 20. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, and His Son Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And uh, there's a couple of other times that that's mentioned, that, that word we know. And so the writing style is you know, very much on par from John to 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. We read that word, or that phrase, we know. And so what John is saying is that I wrote these things down. I know that they are true. I was there, and I wrote them down so that you can know also that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And then he finishes the book with this. Now there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And so, what a beautiful way to end that. Because this is a book of belief. I wrote these down so that you would believe. They were performed in, uh, in front of other people. They didn't believe. And yet you have even more, so many so. I mean, we're just talking about the ones that we know of in public. But all these other ones that uh, John knows about, that the whole world couldn't contain the book. There's just so many of them. And this figure of speech that he uses 
I believe uh, really kind of shows that Christ did everything that he could while he was here to show that he was the Christ, he was the Messiah. All these attesting signs show it, his teachings show it, the resurrection definitely shows it. All right, any questions or comments? All right, so that's how the book ends. Now again, we're going to go back through, uh, next week we'll go through the entire book, but we'll kind of skim over you know, some of the, the attesting signs, and you'll also see where it says these people believed and these people did not, and you'll see that there's starting to be more and more people who do not believe. And here we are reading about it, and we're expected to read it a little bit. All right, there's nothing else. We're going to close the class out.